Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Institute for Government. Uh, when we organised this event probably about three weeks ago, I think we thought that David Cameron might still be Prime Minister, we might still be staying in the European Union, and that actually the aftermath of Chilcot would actually be a very live topic of debate and wouldn't be overshadowed by very dramatic events elsewhere. So that just shows you can't forecast anything in politics these days. Um, we also thought that Peter Riddle, our outgoing director, would chair the event. But when we looked at the cast list, we thought that if we were actually thinking and reflecting on inquiries, it would make sense to have somebody who's actually been a member of an inquiry on the panel. So Peter has decided to move from being chair to being one of our panellists. Uh, so I'm Jill Rutter. I uh, am programme director here at the Institute working on better policy making. And uh, uh, we often say we have a very distinguished panel, but we really do have an extraordinarily distinguished panel tonight. So I'm just going to introduce them all uh, to you. Starting on my left, we have uh, Jonathan Evans, now Lord Evans of Weirdale. Uh, Jonathan was a former Director General of MI5 from 2007 to 2013. Then on my immediate right, I have Sir Paul Jenkins. Uh, Paul, well known to all of you, as says former HM Procurator General, but I knew him as Treasury Solicitor and Head of the Government Legal Service from 2006 to 2014. Uh, then Professor Tony Wright, the uh, lead of the uh, eponymous right reforms, which led to all those changes in Parliament, select committees, etc., but now Professor of Government and Public Policy at UCL, and who also, when he was in Parliament, did an inquiry into parliamentary inquiries, so a commission, so we're going to be uh, very interested to hear about that. And last but not least, Peter Riddle, uh, in his last weeks as Director of the Institute for Government, uh, as you know, not only Institute Government Director, but very distinguished former journalist, and a member of the Gibson Inquiry into Detainees, which he's going to tell us little bits about. Uh, a, an inquiry that, uh, that is, what, a state of suspended animation, Peter? Or no, it, it Formally disbanded? Uh, it, it, it was disbanded, well, I, we'll come on to that. It was disbanded many years ago oh. uh, for reasons which are very interesting on the nature of inquiries. Okay, so that's uh, whatever. So what we're going to do is the format is that I'm going to throw in a few questions to our very distinguished panel, get them to reflect, and then we'll throw it open to you to throw in in your questions. Uh, and we'd be very interested in some reflections from people in the audience, I think, who've also been part or witnessed or experienced some of this process themselves. So I just want to start off um, by thinking, so we had Sir John Chilcott finally gave birth to this mega... Uh, document 2.6 million words, uh, N years in the making, etc., and recommendations. So I just wanted to get the panels, first of all, are there immediate reflections on, not on Chilcot itself, but what have we learnt from the Chilcot process? Let's start with you, Jonathan. What have we learnt from the Chilcot process? Um, I think we have learnt that however much you want to make an inquiry short, in the current climate and with the the perceived requirement that the whole thing should be uh, done in particular sort of legal framework that if you want a thorough report it's going to take a very very long time um, and I would c compare <coughs> I did not you didn't ask me this but I'll say this uh, if you look at the Denning report uh, which on Profumo which was a long time ago uh, that was also that was sort of well, that was judge-led uh, but if you look at the report it is short it is extremely racy and readable, and it's extremely memorable. Uh, and in some ways, that seems to me to be quite a successful outcome, uh, and it put the issues to bed largely. Today, right. Chilcot uh, is extremely authoritative and thorough, uh, but it's not, it by any you know, stretch of the imagination, short or readable or racy. Okay. I think... Um, I mean, essentially, pretty much the same points as Jonathan. For me, if you compare, I mean, I, I was doing some work on um, Denning's papers not very long ago, and um, it was a pretty unfair process. I can't say any more than that. <laughs> um, can't say any more than that because, um, as a result of my work, they remain classified. Um, but it was a pretty unfair process. But it was it was looking at a comparatively small number of events. It was actually looking at 
one or two particular relationships. There was a sort of tailpiece thing, which is every other, every other story affecting pub, the public morality at the moment. But he managed to wipe all that away pretty quickly because there wasn't much in it. Uh, the point I'm making is the narrower the focus, the easier it is. And actually, if you compare what we, we, we started to compare when we were planning this, which is Hutton, Butler, and then Chilcott, and you look at the different terms of reference, they couldn't be more different. And if you give an inquiry a time frame of whatever it was, 2002 to 2009, um, it, it takes a long time to look at all of that. And I think, I mean, the one I worry about enormously mm. is the Goddard inquiry, mm -hmm. whose, whose scope yeah. I think is infinitely greater than even, even Chilcott. Just quite interested, just to come back on this sort of, do you think that the public appetite for the sort of <coughs> denning roughness and readiness is different now? I mean, would that be acceptable nowadays to do something that appears to be less fair, if you like, in... I don't, I, the public would love it, I'm sure, because, I mean, you, but, but I think, you know, at one point, we, we, I think we're going to talk a mm. little bit maybe mm. about the point of inquiries, mm. and there is... There is an element of what, when I was trying to explain to Brian Leveson, mm. you know, what the point mm. of a public inquiry was at the beginning, I said, you know, there is a bit of what I will crudely call theatre. Um, you know, it's, mm. it's a deeply tactless word in the context of most public inquiries where we're dealing with people who've suffered terribly, families who've lost relatives. But there is an element of almost Roman theatre about it. And um, the public love that, um, you know, Leveson having Hugh Grant mm. and all the stars in the witness mm. box, you know, didn't add much to the story, mm. um, but it was important in terms of that. Um, I don't think you could get away with the Denning inquiry now. I mean, it, it really, from what mm. I saw in, the, in his papers, was a deeply, deeply unfair mm. process. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if I was advising a client now, now I'm back at the mm. bar, if I was advising a client to participate in an inquiry like that, I'd be rushing off to do what I try and stop them doing, which is go for judicial review. Okay, that's a useful, salutary thing. Tony, reflections on Chilcot, what did we learn? Well, I was one of those uh, who spent years pressing for an inquiry. Mm. Um, I was also one of those who, who didn't have, or voted against the war. Uh, and I did that despite being a Blairite and despite being actually signed up to liberal interventionism uh, but because I simply was not convinced by the arguments and the evidence. Uh, and so, I, obviously, I was particularly interested in finding out exactly what happened. My reaction to, um, to Chilcott is, well, in one sense, it's exactly what you would have expected. I mean, those who were, who were, who were waiting for some sort of revelation uh, the, we're never going to find it. Uh, those who were waiting for the line which said, so Tony Blair is a liar, uh, were always going to be disappointed. Those who were waiting for the sentence which said, so the war was illegal, were always going to be disappointed. But in many ways, I thought it just told, it, it, it filled out the version that Robin Butler had told us in 2004. And I think if you, if you didn't know at that point, broadly speaking, what had gone wrong, uh, you'd not been paying attention. So was it worth the Yes, wait? of course, because it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's a fact of such enormity mm. that you, you, I'm afraid you do, for all kinds of reasons that no doubt mm. we'll, we'll talk about, you do have to do the exhaustive, detailed exegesis of what, of what happened, but, I, but the underlying mm. story I think we knew already. Peter? I, I, I think two points. One is I mean, I've only dipped into it, and I wouldn't really believe anyone who's done any more than dip into it the 2.6 million words. But it, it, it reads more like an official history, or draft, I should say, of official history, because there isn't very much on lessons learned. In contrast with some earlier inquiries, say, Franks into the Falklands War, which is, which was a parallels actually with Denning. I'm not sure you could get away with the Franks now, but it's more like that. There aren't really any lessons learned, nor does it have, nor which has apparently su succeeded in achieving the other aspect of inquiries, which is the kind of truth and reconciliation. 
letting it all kind of hang out, let the let the, the wounds be there, which, which, of course, in retrospect, the Bloody Sunday Inquiry mm. achieved at enormous cost and enormous length. It hasn't really done that. It, and I and, and, uh, say, I, 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 so my feeling w- I, I about it was, and I agree with your introduction, I mean, we'd be, there'd be a lot more debate about it, but for obvious events now going on. Um, and I, therefore, I felt it didn't r- satisfactorily draw the lessons or do the analysis. <coughs> Uh, um, of it. It was a kind of draft of an official history. Okay. Oh, I was going to say, I, on the truth and reconciliation point, which is, is a hugely mm. important aspect of inquiries, which we might unpack yeah. a bit more later on, but one of the things that I felt very strongly about for a long time is an unholy alliance of some politicians, mm. not all Tony, with um, lawyers and the media raising to ludicrously ridiculous at high levels, the expectations of the people that are the real victims, the families, the survivors in Goddard. Um, And these reports, these inquiries, are never going to deal fully with that element of truth and reconciliation. Then it's not what they're there for. And therefore, I think it 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 is deeply cruel for the, for the families, the survivors or whatever, to have these expectations unfairly built up for narrow political, for media, media purposes. So I want to come on to that. So if we've looked at these, we've mentioned uh, quite a variety of, of inquiries and what they can sort of shed light on. But, but when, in your view, does it actually make sense to set up this sort of you know, really deep, exhaustive... Uh, inquiry. I mean, bearing in mind some of the points that's been raised about the time it takes, the sorts of things. I mean, what are the circumstances that justify that? And in a sense, what are the sort of alternatives that you could go for if you have an issue where there's some sort of compelling public feel that the full story hasn't been told? Are there other alternatives that, you know, if you're a civil servant advising ministers on what your options are, you might look for instead of a, a big inquiry? Paul, yeah, I mean, I, 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 ahead of this, I was jotting down all the inquiries that I've been involved in in my time as Treasury Solicitor and one or two before. Um, it's really difficult to detect any sort of consistent pattern amongst them. But um, I think we start from the presumption, at least I do, that if we go to war, um, you have to have a chilcot of some sort at some point. Not, it, not least to form part of the official history. I mean, a I, I, little bit of my time these days is spent predicting. Um, I predicted Chilcott wrong in one sense in that I thought it might be less explicitly critical of various people than it was. So, you know, got that wrong. Um, but I also said this is a document that's primarily for historians. And that's a compliment coming from me. And I think you need those with wars. Um, contrast that with, I mean, Hutton, Hutton was a, you know, with, with absolutely no disrespect to Dr. Kelly and Dr. Kelly's family, Hutton was a quick political fix. Um, you didn't, re- you know, we could have had an inquest, and indeed an inquest was started and was subsumed within the, um, the, the Hutton inquiry. Um, the, the, I mean, Hutton was quick because it was looking at a tiny, window of events. Um, you know, what was the point of that? I think it was completely the opposite. I didn't think you needed one there, except for political expediency. Leveson somewhere in between the two. Um, we'd all known phone hacking was going on for years. Why suddenly did the catalyst, that f- <coughs> it was Monday evening, I remember where I was, um, I got a very rude text message from an information officer in Whitehall. I can't tell you what the first, two, well, first word was, but the rest of the sentence was, they hacked Millie Dowler's phone, exclamation mark. And I knew we were going to be having a public inquiry, you know, within 24 hours. Um, because the cat had been let out of the bag in a really bad way. So again, a different, different reason for having one. We shouldn't also, sorry, I'll shut up in a second. Let's not forget the bulk of inquiries are into things like failings, Mm. Um, in the health service, that sort of thing. Those sort of, uh, again, wrong word, Matt, perhaps, all, those sort of more mundane business as usual things that just go wrong and impact really horribly on a lot of people. So I'm quite interested here, Tony, um, in Parliament, I mean, obviously, you know, around the time of the Leveston Inquiry, I can't remember the sequence of events, was set up. There were a lot of parliamentary hearings, almost competition between the Home Affairs Select Committee 
and the Cultural Media and Sports Select Committee in having witnesses testifying on Leveson, whether it was the, or not on Leveson on the phone hacking, whether it was Murdoch's or whatever. I was just wondering, you know, when is an issue suitable for a parliamentary inquiry? And when is actually does this sort of public inquiry set up, you know, maybe under a judge, maybe not under a judge, we'll come on to that. Uh, when, you know, well, what you, is particularly appropriate for Parliament? You said at the beginning that we had done a look at mm. Parliament and inquiries. Well, actually, we, we did a, a much broader look than mm. that. We did an inquiry on Into inquiries. Um, <coughs> and uh, without boring you, we mm. went through the sort of issues mm. that you've yeah. asked us about, which is, you know, when do you set up what kind of mm. inquiry? Should there be a menu of inquiries mm. for different mm. purposes? When ministers announce inquiries, should they mm. describe it in mm. terms of the criteria? Mm. You know, all that in a rational yeah. world, <laughs> you would operate yeah. <laughs> like that. But of course, we know we mm. don't live in that world. But it's true that a bit that interested me particularly, and therefore was reflected in what our inquiry uh, on inquiries said, was that or asked the question: Well, where does Parliament? fit into this because uh, in, in, a, in, a, in some sense Parliament's role in the whole business of inquiries has, uh, has diminished over the years. That's, that's despite the, you know, the strengthening of select committees and all that. But it was the, I mean for a long time our, our inquiry system was dominated by what the 1921 mm. Act mm. and that demanded a, a parliamentary resolution. Now when when the government brought in this new act in 2005, the Inquiries Act, it dispensed with that. So it didn't require a parliamentary resolution and there was no mechanism for parliament to produce an inquiry, let alone approve one. And I think there is an issue there. So we discussed ways in which, because I mean, one of the issues about Iraq was that, and we quote Andrew Turnbull in our report saying, oh, the idea of an inquiry was discussed, but immediately dismissed by ministers. I mean, they didn't want one, and for mm. years we didn't, we didn't have a proper yeah. inquiry. That's why the pressure was such. So you know, the question is, well, what does, what does Parliament do if it thinks there ought to be an inquiry on some major mm. issue like this, and yet the government is not setting mm. one up? Can we find a mechanism mm. to do it? That's one issue. And then the other one is, could there not be a sort of inquiry when the issues at stake relate to the conduct of ministers particularly, but ministers and officials, where Parliament itself can set up a commission of inquiry to find out what happens. What happened? We know normally that, part, that the select committees are not good at the forensic fact-finding stuff, but could we develop a model of a commission that would actually do the job that Parliament should do? Uh, and, I, and in fact, we had a we had a, a rather well worked out amendment to the inquiries uh, bill that we were that we that we put down to actually to to to, to secure this and then i was uh, i was lent on by the government uh, on the basis that actually be, there was a particular northern ireland issue that they said was very sensitive and uh, we needed to get the inquiry act immediately done the session was running out uh, so in the space of an afternoon, it all fell away. But uh, I was very, very keen to get this parliamentary bit in to the Inquiries Act. And I still think it's unfinished business. And having looked at the example we've had of a parliamentary, the Andrew Tyree Commission on yeah. Banking, do you think that was a model of what Parliament could do? I think or? it's an example of how you can begin to extend Parliament's ability to get hold of things. And on a different front, if I can just add mm. this for the moment, I mean, one thing that I'm thinking about at the moment, as indeed other people are, is with Brexit, mm. which has got to be processed in some way now by <coughs> Parliament, um, how is Parliament going to do it? And I think there's a real case for some sort of parliamentary commission on the Banking Commission mm. model now that actually does get to grips with this issue. And I mean, the government is tooling itself mm. up to do it. Well, Parliament should be tooling itself up to do it as well. So, Peter, you've, uh, you've watched Parliament in action over quite a long period. You've also seen inquiries or whatever. You know, do you have a thought about where the comparative branch of Parliament is? And, uh, I, Parli I, mean, I, I think that the, the, the Teddy's touched on, on a number of the points, is that when you're inquiring to something that's happened in the past, it's a matter of time scale and resources heavily. 
uh, to do it. Now, it can, I mean, I think when, when Tony talks about commissions, that is, uh, uh, as Andrew Tyree showed on banking, it's possible to do it. It's difficult to do. I think in relation to, um, I mean, it's an interesting example, um, in what I was involved in, the Tony inquiry, we had far more resources of mm. fairly limited inquiry and there was a tight budgetary control um, than any parliamentary committee conceivably had. We had about 15, 16 people, um, a QC, um, a junior, um, civil service on a secondment, mm. and so on and so on, which was absolutely needed mm. to deal with the vast amount of material we had uh, and to process it, mm. and it worked on um, to, to absorb it. And we were never formally launched for various legal reasons, which I can, I can mention later. Now, there is the Intelligence and Security Committee, um, which has, I mean, it's actually, staff has been augmented mm. to, because it is now covering what the Teddy Inquiry tried to do but couldn't do because of um, police investigations. It's now doing it. I'll be very interested to see what time scale. Um, mm. When the uh, Crown Prosecution Service announced a month ago that it was not um, proceeding with investigations mm. in Libya, the two Libya uh, alleged rendi renditions, um, Dominic Grieve, the, cha the chair of the committee, uh, came out and said it may take some time, mm. you bet, um, um, to do that. And so I think it's a question of scale of resources Commitment of time. I mean, as Tony well knows, most select committees are basically four people at the centre who do all the work on them. Um, it's quite difficult if you're having an investigatory inquiry if you've got a limited amount. We were three strong on the detainee uh, inquiry. That worked because we made a commitment, quite a large commitment of time on it. Much harder for an MP to do. What I would like to do mm. is, is to link in inquiries mm. much more with Parliament. Some cases, or accepting that maybe mm. at arm's length, but linking them more in with Parliament on, thing, on issues like that. I mean, now I'm very interested now in Jonathan's director. I mean, if there was a, um, Tony suggested that where sort of that it's about the conduct of ministers or officials, Parliament could have a, a bigger role. I'm quite interested in what that might end up feeling like if you're yeah. in one of the organisations. Obviously, one of the sort of more recent complaints about officials is that, you know, particularly those who have been hauled regularly before the PAC, is that sometimes they feel that they're more there as a sort of bit part actor in a piece of MPs yeah. grandstanding than necessarily being given a fair hearing. I don't know whether that's a fair I mean, it, se it seems to me fairly self, I can say this now, it seems <laughs> to me fairly self-evident that the, the kind of public lynching approach taken by some select committees is not to do with trying to get to the facts. It's to do with getting to the soundbite and, you know, it's an emotional bit of uh, theatre rather than an attempt to understand what has happened and to make sensible judgments on it. And it is not the way in which you will <coughs> establish that kind of set of facts and sensible judgments. Uh, you know, it's, it's damaging to the individuals who take part in it, uh, but the, the people who do it, you know, don't care about that. So, you know, it's a, sh it's a shocking and appalling way uh, to try and address these issues, in my opinion. I am happy to say that I have not been on the receiving end of it, so this is not special pleading from me. Um, the, 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 there is an issue of, of how do you actually find a trusted um, voice to front these issues? And the reason, one of the, you know, we've seen much, much more emphasis on judges because they are seen still, I think, as being the incorruptible kind of priesthood. Uh, which we can ensure, you know, anything that we really, really worried about, give it to the judges and it'll be okay. I think that's actually a bit worrying for judges because they are all, as, as faith in Parliament, politicians, to some extent officials and everything else has sort of fallen away, you end up with judges being the only people that anybody, you know, feels they're able to rest any trust in, which puts an enormous pressure on the judges, actually, and I think it's quite a dangerous position for them to be in. Uh, but, but so far, that's kind of worked all right. In, uh, interestingly, the Chilcot <coughs> report did work, because, even though it wasn't judge-led, and it has had authority, and it has been accepted as being a neutral and disinterested uh, and trustworthy sort of process, and I think that's very encouraging because it means that you, you, you can actually retake some ground, uh, but we definitely need to. I just wanted, while I've got the floor, as it were, to come back on one point that, that, that Paul made, which is that the, the larger the subject, the more difficult, the, 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 the less handleable it is. There are some counterexamples. For instance, Savile, which was you know, events on one day, uh, which took 12 years to you know to to understand uh, so it partly is the question of the scale of the events it's partly a question of who is leading it and what they actually what their own predispositions are 
uh, and you know, I think having a busy person who needs to get on and do something else, uh, leading uh, such as Leveson, is not a bad idea because it actually gives them an incentive to get on with it rather than having somebody who actually would quite like to carry on and do this for a very, very long time. Thank you. So Paul, uh, yeah. There's one thing, yeah. which is expectations of the various <coughs> people affected by an inquiry, which I think is absolutely central. I mean, something Paul touched on is one of the problems, certainly in experience on the Taney inquiry, and it's been true of other inquiries, is that when he, when he referred to kind of victims mm. and so on, is there are often irreconcilable expectations. And the Taney inquiry <coughs> was actually set up with a very narrow remit, <coughs> which was to look at uh, the knowledge and involvement of the British government and the agencies, mm. including uh, Johnson's one, in the alleged um, um, rendition and relations with detainees held by foreign governments. Um, it was quite narrow in that way. However, the, um, the detainees held in Guantanamo, who were at that point when we were set up, were suing the British government, and Paul was on the other side of all that, of course. Um, um, they wanted to turn it into alleged torture inquiry. Mm. And that expect which would have which would have gone way beyond any what any inquiry set up by the British government could have done, because the alleged torture um, was being done um, by foreign governments and, and so on and so forth. And people we could conceivably um, have got as witnesses because there was no legal power to, let alone no willingness to. And that problem of expectation I think is a fundamental one. So from the start, um, the um, a lot of the NGOs in this area, many of them very well informed, um, uh, the lawyers for the detainees uh, were condemning us. So we, and that is a problem I think with quite a lot of inquiries, where you start off with the expectations and you've got to get that right and it's a very, very difficult thing to get right. So I think some very interesting issues coming up here. On the choice of chair, who do you go to? What do they think they're being asked to do? Uh, and actually what conditions your view on, they may be a judge, they're just the sort of last judge to say no to you, or you know, is it easy to persuade judges to, to do this? Uh, are there other people with better chairs? And actually, what makes for good terms of reference and what makes for, for bad terms of reference that are going to sow the seeds? So I don't know, Paul, you probably were responsible <coughs> for recruiting some of these judges to do this. Were you on the end of the phone when someone said, find me a judge, you know, by I'm lunchtime, I'm making a statement, it's right. One, one of the great, um, advantages and one of the differences between Hutton and all the subsequent inquiries was we um, passed the, um, I can't remember what it's called now, not the Constitutional Reform Act, one of those, which, um, mm. which took the um, selection of judges mm. out, of that ex mm. out of the exclusive hands yeah. of the Lord Chancellor, um, who was a minister, mm. and into the hands of the Lord Chief Justice. Um, so um, one of those dark arts which we all purported to be able to exercise, but actually it was all just fraud, um, was saying, <laughs> Judge X, he or she's a safe pair of hands because they never were. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's just what it's what you told your clients, sorry, Jonathan, yeah. um, to, 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 to get them to buy into this. Um, I, I I always struggle with these questions because as a lawyer who's used to working with judges, I know what judges are good at and in and what they are tremendous at is, and what lawyers are good at, is analysing situations, getting to the truth, digging down, sorting out, you know, who's telling the truth, who's lying, all those sort of things. And that is often at the heart of an inquiry. What they know we're near as good at is understanding policy. I mean, I, I, I do a little sort of talk occasionally about the difference between legal logic, which I call normal logic, and political logic, which to a lawyer is utterly irrational. And one of the tricks about being a government lawyer is to be able to do both legal logic and political logic. You know, ministers who are lawyers and can't do the politics terribly well are disastrous as ministers because they don't get the politics. Judges don't get the politics. And you, you see this at every stage in a judge-led inquiry if there are big policy issues. Critically, you see it in the recommendations. And um, if you get you get some judge-led inquiries, lawyer-led inquiries, where the recommendations are really politically for the birds. Um, if you'd had someone, if you'd had a former, a former permanent secretary, a former senior minister, they'd be much more attuned to what would actually be deliverable. So name names. Uh, yeah, 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 I knew you were going to say that. I'm not doing that on that one. <laughs> not doing that on not while you're tweeting this no, away. No, no. <laughs>
I can tell Emily to stop tweeting, but of course other people could be tweeting hashtag IFG Chilcott. So thanks very much for, for the reminder that you are all very welcome to to tweet, because it was quite interesting. I mean, yeah, one of the ones that we looked at as policy people, for example, was the Francis Inquiry mm. on mid-staffs, which produced, yeah. I think, 287 mm. recommendations. Yeah. Mm. And you did look at it and mm. think, no sane person would ever serve on a hospital board, ever. Yeah, your, your report the on that is quite rude. Yeah. I'll name so. Francis, it's but blame you. So. Yes. Anyway, yeah. she just uh, I said... Levis, uh, Levis, I think this isn't critical of Brian Levison. You may have already got the impression I think mm -hmm. he's fantastic and did a fantastic job. Um, there was a sort of rolling debate mm -hmm. all the way through about, really, was there any point in this? Because was any, any serious politician ever going to mm -hmm. do anything with any serious recommendation at any point? And um, mm -hmm. we sort of found out the answer eventually, didn't we? So does this <laughs> point to the need for mixed panels? I mean, you, Peter, you were a three-person panel, yeah. I think, on... We, we, I, we, I mean, the chair was Peter Gibson, who was a very distinguished chancery judge, who had, ha had also been Intelligent Services Commissioner, mm. um, which meant he understood the area very well. He was also... Um, I mean, you've just got the quality of a first-class legal mind. Mm. But he, interesting enough, he never particularly operated in the, in the political world. And mm. it, was quite, it, was, it was quite striking. And the other, other mm. member was Janet Perescava, who had been the civil mm. service commissioner and had been uh, run the law society. Mm. Um, I, I, because we were never formally launched, um, um, we never quite got to that stage. But some of the dilemmas... I think one of the interesting things is a clash of cultures, which is between lawyers and civil servants. Because on the secretariat we had, we had extremely distinguished uh, QC. She's now um, um, on the bench mm. um, as a judge, deservedly so. And um, we had two or three very good lawyers, and then the rest were civil servants. And there was, they had very different approaches. Mm. And that was one of the absolutely fascinating things which emerged, certainly for me coming from a very different world at that stage, was the way lawyers build up a case as the way civil servants do. Civil servants tend to make the best of what they've got. Lawyers have a kind of perfection perfection and that could produce quite an interesting clash. So Tony what were your reflections from your work your inquiry well, into inquiries we, uh, on actually what worked for what? Well we ran through this and of course what you discover is that some judge-led inquiries work well some non-judge-led <laughs> inquiries work well and the reverse in yeah. each the reverse in each case the bit that I think uh, that has not been yet mentioned mm. is that is the is the worry from the judicial side and certainly this was a worry that Lord Wolfe expressed to us quite strongly at the time was that if if you put judges in to do politically sensitive inquiries that's bad for the judiciary mm. so i think that you know that is a very that's another reason mm. for thinking that you ought to find mm. another inquiry model mm. when 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 you're dealing with politically sensitive mm. issues just on the the point of terms of reference i think that is quite an interesting it may, it may seem a nerdy point but in fact i think it's quite you see it's blown up now in relation mm. to chilcott mm. now now people, uh, people are saying, well, they put FOI stuff in, haven't they? Wanting to, wanting to have access to the documents relating to the setting up of the inquiry and to its terms of reference on the basis that, that oh, well, if it, if, it, if it wasn't allowed to look at legality, no wonder it didn't. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, did, was, it, was, it, uh, was it warned off? Now, that, I think there is, and we, we said this, and other people have said it too, I think, I think indeed the House of Lords committee that looked at the Working of the Inquiry Act <coughs> yeah, last yeah. year said something similar, which is that um, there is a case, I think, for a sort of a period of, of uh, consultation around terms of reference, because they, they are, like, like the choice of chair, which is crucial, terms of reference are crucial, because that is the framework within which you're operating. You don't get that right, and it's clear that the chair of an inquiry has to have a major input into that. But I think there is a case for having a period of consultation uh, and reflection uh, when you test out terms of reference and involve Parliament in that process too so that people afterwards don't say ah well uh, you know we were not involved in setting it up and you've excluded all kinds of things. about um, <coughs> developing a better parliamentary model. I, Jonathan could have been speaking my lines when he talked about um, the way that some s select committees behave, frankly, scandalously um, for cheap political reasons, irrespective of the, of the issues or the personal hurt and damage that they do. Contrast that with the banking inquiry, which seemed to me to be an important evolutionary step along the way to having a proper parliamentary model and, and I mean we in my department we provided legal resources I we recognized right at the outset that, <coughs> that 
Andrew Tari wasn't going to want, parliamentarians weren't, weren't going to want a Robert J type figure stealing the limelight, um, and that's fair enough, but they did need it, and I, th I think we got the model quite, quite right there in terms of lawyers in the main behind the scenes, but helping guide the questioning process. And I think, I think there's a piece of work to be done if it hasn't already been done, um, looking at how that worked and how that, as I say, can be the beginning of a, of a new model. So their model, because I want to come <coughs> on to this point about whether you want lawyers, because obviously George Hillcott rejected having lawyers yeah. doing the questioning, yeah. whereas in Savile, yeah. I think yeah. the opening statement by the opening the QC yeah. for the inquiry lasted four months. Yeah. I find that slightly different to believe, but that's what... Uh, what I think one of the things we have to, one of the things you have to remember about Savile, and, and Jonathan's absolutely right to pick me up on this, it was a tiny, tiny incident in time mm. terms. Um, you have to remember the history, which mm. was the Widgery inquiry, which mm. was uh, you know, probably the epitome of whitewashing. Yeah, right. um, and one of the lessons is if you're going to do that, you will eventually, certainly in the context of something like either Northern Ireland, have to do it properly, and it's going to be much, much harder to do it right, properly okay. same time around. Joe, what, what one yeah. thing which I think is relevant at this mm. stage is, and it, it also applied to the Soham inquiry, which was generally regarded as a success done by <coughs> um, our first director, uh, yeah. Michael Bichard, and that it was done after the murderers mm. had been sent to jail. And one of the really mm. big issues is are there still criminal or other potential <coughs> actions around? Because I think that, I know Michael Bichard said that they could do, the, he could do the inquiry and he did it quite mm. quickly because the guilty had been mm. jailed. It's very difficult to combine the inquiry which has got behind it is someone going to be prosecuted mm. at the same time as doing the inquiry. And just very briefly, one reason why the training inquiry was never launched is there were police, in, uh, there were police inquiries there were two lots of police inquiries going on. And it's, under British law, quite rightly, you can't ask for fresh evidence from people mm. while the police are still investigating because there's a double jeopardy point. So all you could get is existing papers. You couldn't ask for new papers from Jonathan and so on. Jonathan's agency and others were extremely helpful with, and, and mm. forthcoming with existing evidence, but they couldn't, nor would they be willing to testify, because again, double jeopardy, until the police inquiries were ended, and then a whole set of fresh allegations happened about Libya, which kicked everything into touch and made it impossible. But that was always a shadow, and that applies, I mean, it, it's, it's been around in other inquiries, mm -hmm. and that's why Soham worked, because they got, you got over that step. And that's why Soham actually produced practical recommendations. The focus could mm. then be on practical recommendations rather than getting into guilt and so on. So I was pleased you made that point yeah. because mm. I think the, the interplay between the criminal justice system mm. and the inquiries mm. process can be really, really mm. difficult to mm. manage because you know, they can sort of get onto the same pitch at the same time and sort of get in each mm. other's way quite badly as they did mm. in that case. The other thing, and, it, and it, again, it, it applies to the detainee case, is that, of course, Soham was about what happened in Cambridgeshire, uh, and it was domestic, mm. and therefore you could, to some extent, mm. contain it, whereas many of the issues, including, of course, uh, Iraq, uh, it wasn't just the Brits that were playing, and therefore you get issues of competence and scope which go well beyond anything which you know, we can determine domestically. So I think you need to be very careful if you've got something which involves the actions of foreign governments, etc., etc., because you are then into a whole new ball game, and it's difficult, can be difficult to get the evidence, and it can be quite tricky to make any judgments on it because you won't have had the evidence. So the interplay between the two is complicated. So it's set up an inquiry that never launches because it sort of looks like a sort of case of. Yeah, was it misconceived from the start that that was the right time to do it, or did something interfere? I'm just quite interested in the sort of, you know, is there a sort of political expediency that says I need to set up an inquiry, and then there's interaction with actually, but in the real world, this is the wrong time to be doing it, that you get caught into it? Essentially, as I, as I recall it, in 2010, there was a sort of package. Um, but we knew we'd got various issues that needed to be yeah. sorted out. We needed to do something about the courts. We needed what the media and some politicians immediately labelled mm. secret courts. We needed a way of doing justice that was fair to the people who were seeking justice, but also wasn't deeply unfair to, to <coughs> the state and to the people the state was trying to protect, i.e. all of us. And we needed to find a better way of doing that. So we needed the justice, but we needed to deal with the Guantanamo claims, um, which um, 
I mean, I think you know, I'm and others on record are saying, you know, that if we'd litigated them, it would have taken 10 years, 100 million quid, we'd have won, but only at the expense of destroying our relationship with the Americans. Um, so mediating that away was fascinating and also a very important part of it. And then the final bit, which is supposed to be the easy bit, um, I mean, we got our secret courts, we got the mediation, was the inquiry. Um, and I think it would have worked. It was the Libyan thing that, that yeah, knocked it on the head. I mean, Peter talked about the, the, the police mm. investigations that were going on in relation to Gitmo. Once they'd finished, it, this, your inquiry would have been easy. Um, mm. As soon as the Libyan ones mm. were thrown in, we all thought this, this just doesn't, isn't going to no, work right, any time okay. soon because you can't look into those things until the police are finished. Yeah, but, and that, that's that's also, <coughs> but it's also relevant that that did follow on from the creation of the new government, the, the coalition government. Yeah. And the reason that this was on the top of government's minds was because they'd come into a new situation, they'd already made a variety of statements in opposition, and therefore there was a political wish and need to get this sort of under control and resolved and off. And the Prime Minister at that stage, was, uh, former Prime Minister, uh, was very keen to see this sort of, you know, sorted out so that we can move on because it's, uh, it's a problem in the past and therefore we need to get it sorted out. And so we'll do a year and get somebody to come and do an inquiry and then that will be done. So we've had some examples of some sort of sharp inquiries, some quite quick inquiries, which are domestic, sort of sort of <coughs> a containable issue, quite tight terms of reference, etc. I just wonder whether any of you had any views on some of the sort of other things that people think sort of drive the length and potentially the cost <coughs> of inquiries. We've had this debate about whether you ought to employ QCs and let <coughs> sort of other people have uh, use lawyers to give evidence. Uh, I think uh, Paul and I thoughts about maximisation, you know, this idea that you've got to be fair, it goes a bit to the first questions you're raising about fairness and be seen to be fair, where everybody gets comments. I don't know whether you've got any reflections on sort of drivers of length and whether actually you almost get a thought that an inquiry sort of, you know, was important but maybe comes too late, takes too long to actually have the impact that it really needed. Terry, do you have any thoughts well, about what I mean, governments reason, can do what, to make the, them more the reason, One of the major reasons for introducing this inquiry, <coughs> Inquiries mm. Act, which is now mm. the, governing, the governing legislation for inquiries, it's not that all inquiries are, are come through that make they don't, uh, nor probably should they. But they, but it but it was designed to deal with those issues of, of cost and, and and you know getting estimates at the beginning and and all these other sort of operational issues. Now we you know we don't yet know. I think the House of Lords actually, when it reported on the operation of the mm. Act just last year, gave it a, a good bill of health really, and it wanted some tweaks. But on the whole, said seems to be working seems to be working well so i think you know you you, you know we, we make progress but th can i just say one thing the thing that has not been said at all yet and i would have said it at the beginning um is is you know is that we should we should celebrate the inquiry tradition in britain i mean it, it, it is it, it is a you know we take these things for granted, and we're very critical of these inquiries when they happen mm. and all the rest of it. But the fact is, if you go, I mean, we went on a trip to America to look at mm. Congress and all that. There, they, you know, they, they, they could not stop falling about in praise of, of, our, of our long established inquiry mm. tradition. Mm. And it's absolutely, it is a, it's a fundamental accountability mm. ingredient of our public life, long standing, with mutations, different forms. But the fact that it's so embedded in our public life is, is something to celebrate. So uh, I think that's the context in which we want to try to put some more rationality around it and to, imp and to improve it. Can I just say, well, I've got the floor. I do agree m mainly with what's been said about the infirmities of select committees. Um, and I say that as someone who thinks they are the, their development has been the best thing that's happened to Parliament in recent times and the fact that they can march in anybody to give evidence who will particularly those powerful figures who don't want ever to appear in public mm. they are now routinely forced to come and answer to the people's rep you know that is a good thing yes there's grandstanding yes there's incoherent yes there's no forensic <coughs> approach yes 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 all that is true but it, you know that is a huge resource that we ought to think seriously about how we 
how we develop. And that's why I'm quite interested uh, in thinking about how that bit of the field could be, could be improved. I think it's quite interesting whether there's a tension between thinking, if I set this up, it, am I creating a sort of monster that's going to eat my departmental budget, last for years and stuff like that, against you know, being willing to, commu you know, if you had a sort of quicker, you know, cash limited, no, maybe not, um, but sort of, you know, a tighter well, sometimes model. Sometimes, you know, this is the, the famous Harold Wilson quote about, you know, commissions yeah. that uh, take minutes and last yeah. for years. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was, I mean, that was seen as their great merit, yeah. is that you were likely not to be around when they, <laughs> <laughs> when they yeah. report. Yeah. Le Leveson was given a budget. Yeah. He said he was going to do it in a particular time, and he did. I think. I mean, I, one of the things that slightly surprised me preparing for tonight was the extraordinary amount that's been written about inquiries yeah. over the years. I mean, there's, there's, there's a wealth of stuff. What I haven't found is anything with, which addresses one of my little pet sort of queries, which is whether the reason things get very slow with too many lawyers. Um, and with maximisation is whether people have become too risk averse about the threats of judicial review um, at every stage of the process. I mean, you, you start digging around in this and you read, you can't have a judge-led inquiry with counsel to the inquiry without every single person who's representing having the right to have a QC representing them paid for by the taxpayer. Is that really right? I, I'm far from sure that it is. Um, I was looking at the original judgments this afternoon that led to the concept of maximisation. Um, they were the, the, the judgments of the first instance and Denning in the Court of Appeal on Robert Maxwell trying to sort of clobber um, the inquiry into Pergamon. And, um, they, they dismiss all this idea that you need some <coughs> massive formal panoply of excessive fairness. Um, one of the judges in the Court of Appeal says, this is just <coughs> about fairness. Let's not lay down great practices and procedures mm. and rules. This is about basic fairness. It's really difficult to describe mm. fairness. Fairness is like an elephant, he says. <laughs> you know, very difficult to describe, but its yeah, elephantine it's qualities yeah. make it um, obvious what it is. At I sometimes wonder, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to hear from people who've actually mm. done maximisation processes, whether, whether they felt they were really necessary in the detail they were, um, to be fair. Okay, I think I'm going to, uh, uh, I think there may be some people in the audience who know something about this, she says, uh, looking well, around. Well, she is smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to catch Margaret's eye. Uh, don't feel obliged, Margaret. No, anyway, um, I'm going to actually, I've got one or two more questions, but I'm going to throw it open to people now to get some of your input. So maybe you could tell us who you are. I don't know, Margaret, whether you ever feel you want to share any of your thoughts. Margaret Aldrich, who is Secretary of the Chilcot Inquiry, so well done, Margaret. Uh, whatever, who's there? Some people recognise him. But let's go and see if there are any questions. If there's anyone next door who wants to come in, please come in to ask a question. I'll take them in a sort of little groupette. Uh, Yes, in the front row. Can you tell us who you are? Yeah, my name is David Lowry. I'm a, <coughs> a researcher in the House of Commons, but I've been working with parliamentarians in Westminster and the European Parliament for about 40 years, and um, both given evidence to inquiries and uh, helped politicians participate in them. My question actually, funnily enough, was about maximisation even before you raised the issue now. And it's to do with the way in which the maximisation has um, been used by those who've seen parts of the evidence or parts of the reports that referred to them in the Chilcot inquiry. I was quite uh, interested to note that Tony Blair, um, Alistair Campbell, uh, Peter Mandelson, and today Margaret Becker on the floor of the House of Commons all used exactly the same construction and interpretation of what they claimed the uh, Chilcot inquiry said about the non-interference um, with the uh, intelligence evidence. And they all said it and asserted it, and they, all of them, all four of them are wrong completely, were 100% wrong, if you just actually look at the text of what is written in the actual report. And the reason why I, I raise it now is because I think it, the, the, the only possibility in this is that Mr. Blair was the only one who actually was given parts of the document uh, to, to look at. 
and the others weren't. And when the, when the Chilcot Inquiry was actually launched, uh, Alistair Campbell was in Barcelona, so he couldn't possibly have seen it. And yet he did an interview within an hour of the report coming out, and he gave exactly the same construction as Mr. Blair gave in the afternoon in his very long press conference. And in my judgment, that, that's a complete perversion of the, what maximization process was supposed to be about. Because they, maybe it's understandable, but Tony Blair and, and his political friends completely politicized and perverted that document. They got their story together, they repeated it in public and on television and radio, and the journalists, unfortunately, are not sufficiently well read or haven't read the report properly, and I haven't challenged them. But people like myself have read the report and, and, and do challenge them. And I think that if you're going to have a maximization process, there must be some kind of limitation that people who've, who've had it to make, to, to make it fair to them, that they don't make it that very okay. unfair to everybody else. Okay, do you want to do yeah. in relation to that? First of all, um, I, 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 I can talk about the... the um, mm maximization process because I retired just before the letter started coming out so I haven't got any sort of confidentiality issues there but unless it was very different from every other maximization process I've seen the people that got the letters were told you know they were under a strict obligation to not to talk to anyone other than their lawyers about that um, difficult to enforce whatever but the other point and I, 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 I can't go into the detail that you've got obviously but the sort of flaw in the thesis of this misuse of maximization is they see what's originally said about they're going to be proposed to be said about them, they comment on it, they pull it apart, they don't see they meant it the result of, of the, the combination of what they saw and their mm -hmm. comments. So the first time mm -hmm. that Blair or Mandelson or whoever will have seen the words that they're commenting on and the first time they can be sure that those are actually the words is when they're published in the report. The, the maximization process may have changed mm -hmm. the text quite radically, and I suspect, mm -hmm. certainly in some inquiries I've been involved in, it does change it quite radically. Mm. Any other comments on that, Peter? Yeah, I, mean, I just... I, I, I mean, to journalists there, if not... Sort no, of I mean, I mean the, or, the, uh, I, I, it's very interesting with reports. You can, um, f on the whole, focus on the key issues. Also, there's a history. And most people writing about um, Chilcot, or lots of them, um, have been following it for a long time, and lots of them actually um, were writing about it in 2003 and following it up. So it wasn't totally new to them. Most of them knew, and most of them knew what the key issues were. Certainly in that area of the, uh, the, the, uh, the dossier of September 2002 and all that stuff. Um, and they could pick out very quickly what the key issues were. Remember, there was also a lock-in so that people actually had time to absorb it for several hours. So that was an important point. The other point, just on, I, I, I can't align what Paul said. I happened to, not one of the people you've mentioned, but I did um, happen to bump into, um, two weeks before the report came out, someone who was a prominent player, and we were just chatting away, and he said, I really don't know because I saw what I was shown, <coughs> and I don't know what's going to be in the final version at all. Um, and so just underlining what Paul's saying that I think one can be to conspiracy theory on, 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 on these things, actually. Well, I, I just, just to sort of emphasise that last point, I saw someone today um, who'd had a Maxwell letter, had responded very fully to it, and was ranting and raving about how he'd been treated, and I said, have you actually read what it says about you? Oh, I couldn't be bothered with that. Um, and, and I said, well, you might just read it. Um, he'd read the headlines. You might just read the detail, because it's not quite as bad as you appear to think it is. Anyway. Um, okay. Anyway, let's go there, James. I'm James Kidner from the Royal College of Defence Studies, and thank you. It's been a fascinating discussion, um, but I'm anxious that I shouldn't be peddling away a bit discouraged, because I fear I can't share Professor Wright's enthusiasm for the, for the uh, beneficence of these processes. And I think uh, the public in general is troubled by £200 million spent on Savile and two and a half million words uh, um, produced by... Lord Chilcott, because it, it doesn't, at the end of this process, satisfy anyone. And I, I guess my question is, is tied in with the opportunity cost that these inquiries swallow. You know, speaking of someone who's worked for, in the Foreign Office and with the Scott inquiry, the way in which these inquiries gum up the machinery of government and therefore stop it doing things that the public expect of it mm -hmm. is something that the, uh, did I say, the 
publicity around the inquiries never covers. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, if you had, I mean, you've touched on this already, but if you had a magic wand and could wave it over this process, how would you suppress the insatiable public appetite for these things and what easy wins are there to be won out there to, to, to make them quicker, more efficient and less ubiquitous? Okay, well I want to actually pick up because that was one of my, one of my remaining questions. James mentioned some words I've written down, which is the opportunity costs. Uh, I'm very interested, uh, Jonathan, maybe in your reflections on what actually is it like to be on the, for your organisation to be having to cope with the burdens of responding you know, to an inquiry while trying to get on with the day job as well? I think I've made two observations on that. The first is on the resource side, that you shouldn't underestimate what a lot of resources this takes. And particularly, and if, if you had the perfect information and IT system in your department where every piece of information were, appeared <laughs> once, was uh, accurate, uh, was retrievable and, uh, and all that, then that would be marvellous uh, because you'd, when they said, please, could you answer the following questions, you'd say, certainly, we'll, we'll put them in the machine, there will be the answer and there you can have it. Uh, so, but, of course, it isn't like that. And it's the same problem that we have in a mega way with disclosure in some criminal cases, that you know, the disclosure process is actually non-trivial. And certainly, you know, this, this was a criminal uh, disclosure case, but you know, we, we literally, within the, within the agencies, ended up with a separate building had to be uh, rented for government mm -hmm. uh, with 70 or 80 staff working full-time on disclosure for two years. Uh, and still the other side and indeed the judge was very frustrated at our lack of application to get the disclosure done. And so there is a huge resource burden in getting the information available in a consistent way to the inquiry uh, and that's a problem. Uh, the other thing is the question, particularly when there is the potential for blame or indeed legal process to come out of this, of how do you maintain the commitment and morale of staff who feel that they have been doing their very best in difficult circumstances for moderate pay and potentially in personal danger and then they have to spend the next you know x period going through this jeopardy and indeed you know obviously the the deal is that anything you say in an inquiry will not be used to incriminate you uh, but does that mean that what is said in an inquiry could be used to incriminate your colleagues and friends uh, and therefore, you know, how do people feel about giving evidence if they feel that what they are saying might be used against their mm -hmm. colleague? Um, and so there's quite a big leadership issue in trying to make people continue to want to and be willing to engage with this positively, given all the downsides. So it does have, I mean, it wouldn't, you know, it wasn't certainly, you know, the, the inquiry that Peter you know, sat on, uh, you know, we continue to operate and so on. But it is quite a lot of resource and it does take quite a lot of leadership to make sure that people continue to see this as being a positive contribution yeah. to national life as opposed to uh, victimising people who are doing their best. And that's quite a difficult yeah. balance to keep. So any thoughts on what we might do to make sure that we get inquiries only when they're really the best way of actually laying an issue to rest satisfactorily? And you know, we've exhausted other maybe you know, alternatives that could have achieved similar results, but in a less resource-intensive way. Paul, when you're being uh, pressed by ministers, I want an inquiry, an inquiry. I, need it now. I, I think it, 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 it would be extremely unusual for me, and I suspect anyone in my position, to say, yes, minister, why don't you have a public mm. inquiry? You know, it, it, mm. it, it, it's, it's a sort of borderline insane <laughs> recommendation. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, nevertheless, um, actually Leveson was one example where as soon as I saw what had happened, I thought we're going to have to have an inquiry and interestingly, we talk about getting judges, it's always incredibly difficult to get serving judges to sit on inquiries because they're such a, an expensive and scarce resource. Um, on that one, there was absolutely no trouble in persuading the Lord mm. Chief Justice because he too could see that he'd got to provide a judge. It was such a massive problem. Um, I always wonder with the benefit of hindsight, if, if we'd known about um, Rebecca and what was he called, and um, Andy Coulson, would, how, how brave would Cameron have been then if all that was going to come out? Because it went, it went wrong in a way that 
Nobody <laughs> expected. I mean, I'm waffling here because mm. I really can't think of an answer to this. Uh, there will always be inquiries when ministers are under pressure to find a way of coming up with answers, dealing with the truth and reconciliation elements of it, dealing with issues, major elements in our history, as in Iraq. But I can just take one thing which is a really difficult one. Which, is, which Paul referred to earlier, which is the whole child abuse one, mm -hmm. um, which uh, the New Zealand judge um, is tackling. And um, I, I think there's a real problem there. No mm -hmm. one denies the suffering mm -hmm. now mainly middle-aged mm -hmm. uh, people had um, when talking 30, 40 years ago. <laughs> However, my real worry is of expectations being yeah. raised which can never, ever be satisfied <coughs> for mm -hmm. any of those people. Yeah. Um, a lot of the perpetrators are dead or very old. The evidence is, is uncertain. Um, okay, there have been some criminal trials and some prominent, prominent mm. cases. Um, but I, 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 that's what worries me on some things on inquiries. And it, as Paul, Paul's <laughs> saying, the hardest thing is to say no or to restrict an inquiry. And I, I, you know, I just wonder in this case um, what will actually emerge because of the scope of it. The regional office is being set up. Mm. Um, um, there's a vast um, um, thing, I, I'm not denying the, 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 the suffering, the genuineness of it, yes. but the degree to which yeah. an inquiry can ever meet anyone's concerns, yes. I, I, I doubt. Yeah. Tony, when you were doing your, you said that the UK system of inquiries was sort of widely envied and sort of praised when you went. So I wonder if you saw any other examples of other countries which tackle these issues in a in a different way that, uh, that struck you as being effective? Well, we saw how not to do it in the United States. We tend yeah. to think, we tend to think yeah. the United States is a wonderful, vigorous, open society, which it is in many ways, mm -hmm. but it's inquir and, and, you know, powerful mm -hmm. congressional inquiries. Yeah. But the fact is they get bogged down in partisanship yeah. uh, and they lose, they lose their, their, their way. I think, you know, I, I, I liked your question mm -hmm. because I, I, it, it goes to the heart of it. See, I think, I, I, think we, I think there is something very valuable about having the confidence in your public life and your political system to inquire into things that go wrong in an open way. And I think that's, that is a test of a, of a political system, its ability to do that rather than to cover them up or sweep them away. There's an enormous amount of cynicism about all this, and of course, I mean, we, we have a lovely quote from mm. Michael Heseltine in our report, Heseltine saying, try not to have an inquiry, but if, you, if, you, if you're going to have one, um, decide what your conclusions are going to be and find a chairman. Mm. Uh, so, you know, but, but, so there are, but we can do it well. Sometimes we do do it well. I mean, I'm not going to bore you with it, but we give, we give a checklist mm. of eight questions that a minister should, should try and answer in saying why an inquiry is being held and they we think I mean there are good they are good questions but it doesn't alter the fact that I guess when I was a, a, a you know a, a politician I was probably demanding an inquiry three times a day about something and they do and the newspaper you know and so it's a, it's it's a brave minister and that's why you need your checklist in a way it's a brave minister who says actually I don't think we need an inquiry or at least we don't not want that kind of inquiry about this issue and I just can I just say one more thing, which is that we haven't really gone on to the to the to the what happens bit, because yep. I mean you know there are many justifications yes. of having an inquiry, um, yeah. finding out what happened, yeah. public reassurance, yeah. you know, trust in the system, but one of them is learning the lessons, mm. and so you have to ask the what happens question, mm. and it, and I think it's worth just asking after Chilcot. Oh, so so what happens? <laughs> so what happens? I, I, I've got one or two. Okay, well, let's, let's, uh, I know Mary wants to come in, but I'm quite keen that we do do the what happens, yeah. what happens, you know, where do inquiries make an impact? Cause I always read David Cameron's statement saying, well, actually, it's, it's happened. We've learned the lesson. We've actually changed our process. We've got the National Security, we've done this and we've done that. And it's, it's okay now, well, it seemed to be my reading of his statement, but... Uh, the, the, but this, this is another problem with the timeliness one, you see, yeah. that there's, there's little... There's little point in having a, 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 a report mm. on events uh, so far after the events that the whole system has mm. changed anyway. And I, can, yeah. I mean, we went, we, you know, finding out what happened on Bloody Sunday 
was an, it was a considerable inquiry inside the government system, let alone trying to sort of put it out to Savile. Uh, and even more recently, because most organisations change the whole time, so coming up with a set of requirements mm. about, I mean, you have, first of all, you have to try and reconstruct and remember what the system was at the time, and then it can be inquired into, and then you can have recommendations mm. saying it needs to be changed when it doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, you get a, you get a sort of daft outcome, which is why there, there are some benefits in doing something quick, even if, it's not, even if it doesn't yeah. settle the whole thing. If there are really issues that need to be sorted out, you probably need to get to those not 15 years after the event. Conversely, cool. um, things can have got worse. Um, I mean, from, <laughs> fr and, and, therefore, and the reports are therefore very, very timely and valuable. Mm. I mean, wearing my hat as a lawyer, mm. a government lawyer, um, I, I was quite shocked to read, I think it's chapter five of the Chilcot report, which is, is, is the detailed exposition of what happened <coughs> in relation to the government lawyers and the Attorney mm. General. Um, I think what should come out of that is greater rigour, greater discipline about the obtaining and the deployment of legal advice. And I feel that particularly strongly because although in Chilcot, Jack Straw comes out of it quite badly in terms of dismissing legal advice, Jack Straw was one of the good guys when it came to taking legal advice. You know, people like Jack Straw and Theresa May, I'm not just saying this because she's our new Prime Minister, you know, they get, they, they, they get the toughest of toughest legal advice, they have the toughest and toughest of legal problems, but they accept it. There are far too many ministers, and I would say a growing number, who have a, take a cavalier approach to legal advice. And if anything good comes out of Chilcot, from the lawyer's point of view, it will be better process. And that's a good thing. One point related to that and, uh, is the uh, inquiry reports, that's it. And, 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 it I mean, mm. all the effort that, that Margaret and her team, and one thing which, hasn't been, which I think is worth bearing in mind, one prior accusation has totally disappeared, which is a whitewash one. Uh, totally disappeared, everyone regards it totally fair, balanced report. I think that's a really important aspect. But it's reported, there was a two-day, there was a debate in the Lords yesterday, there's a two-day debate in the Commons, which for reasons which escape me won't get much attention. Um, um, and that's kind of it. And that's one of the issues with reports, that they, they, can, they can be left and there's no follow-up. The people involved in the exercise are exhausted, worn out, they want to go and do other things, so we get on with their lives, get back to other things. Mm. And the, but one interesting exception which is what Michael Bichard did after the SOEM report. He informally, um, on his own bat, with no legal authority, um, assembled the people uh, 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 to go back to look at what happened to recommendations. Now, of course, his recommendations were intensely practical mm. ones about liaison mm. between the police mm. and social services mm. and so on. I mean, alas, as we now subsequently know, the problems that keep on recurring. Mm. Um, but the, I think that's a very interesting issue because there is a danger, a report's done, okay, whew, it's out of the way, when in fact not coming back to it. And whose actual interest is it sometimes to come back to it? So Tony, in some ways the obvious people to come back would be relevant parliamentary select committees. I mean, these things are out there. These are sort of grist the mill. Government should do X, Y, Z better. And then to come back after a year and do a sort of systematic set of, I know that Parliament doesn't particularly like systematic set of inquiries, but to actually do a sort of systematic reconvention of actually, so you said this inquiry, it said X, where are you would actually be quite a good use of Parliament taking yeah. these things forward. I think Peter mentioning the Bichard inquiry yeah. is, is, a, is good because I think that also set a precedent because I think inquiries since then mm. have become much more interested in the, in the what after mm. bit and have mm. set sort of milestones of action yeah. and report back and that then places <laughs> obligation upon the commissioning department yeah. actually to, to keep an eye on this thing to see what's mm. happening. It's certainly the case that select committees and we su suggested that an addition to their core task should be exactly this mm. is to is to do follow-up work on because you know we spend a lot of money and yeah. as I keep saying a lot of money and time on these things uh, but then who who tracks them mm. af after that um, and of course it's what's even more infuriating is that often they say the same thing think of the child abuse inquiries mm. that say the same thing mm. over mm. and over again we have mm. a little bit of fun in our report mm. ten years mm. ago by actually taking the words mm from the Franks uh, report after the Falklands mm. and the Butler report on intelligence mm. after Iraq. And almost word for word, you've got the same things being, being said. So yes, yes, yes. Um, but if, you know, but if, mm. then just to, if I was in Parliament now, I'd be thinking, I mean, as my members mm. of Parliament are thinking, well, where does this 
you know, where does this, you know, this big report all this year, all these years, we pressed for it, cost mm. a fortune, um, we now know all the de detail. Now what do we do? Mm. Now what do we do? Okay, Mary. Yeah, and then we'll go over here, Mary. Thank you. Um, Mary Dozhevsky, I'm a journalist, um, and I covered um, the run-up to the Iraq war um, for The Independent um, as diplomatic editor, mm. and I also covered some of the Chilkut inquiry. Um, my question is really related to what you were talking about, what happens. Um, and I fully accept that journalists and um, people concerned who think that they were badly done by um, have inflated expectations about what can come out of an inquiry. Um, but what you frequently see, and we saw especially with the Chilkut inquiry, is that there were people who, while they didn't act illegally, um, nonetheless, they made colossal mistakes. Um, and they made mistakes while they were in public office. Then they left public mm. office, and they did very well for themselves. Mm. And if you're out there as a member of the public, mm. you think, well, what comeback is there? So is that a question that, what come back, could yes. there be? Yes, is, is there some way of, 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 of answering it? Yeah. Tony. Well, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, these, these, this mm. should be, ex mm. this is why, of course, people are now talking, some people talk about impeachment, mm. some people talking about, you know, war I, I, I don't think, I, I don't think any of that will get mm. anywhere, frankly, because I think mm. for all kinds of reasons, <coughs> to do with how these things operate. And I think in a way, as someone said earlier on, mm. I think in a way this is protracting the agony of uh, some of the families involved to let them believe mm. that somehow there is still somewhere to, mm. to go. But, but, but nevertheless, having said that, <coughs> although I said that mm. I voted against, against the way, had I been a member of parliament who voted for it, I would, I would, I would absolutely, well, I'm, I am livid anyway, but I'd be even more mm. livid that I felt mm. I'd done it on a false pr prospectus. I mean, and, and, uh, you know, after the Scott inquiry, there was a parliamentary resolution passed in both houses that said, oh, I've got the text of it here somewhere, that it is of paramount importance that ministers give accurate and truthful information to this house and its committees. Mm. And that then was incorporated into the ministerial mm. code. Now that didn't happen. Now that, I, I'm not one of those who thinks that Tony Blair deliberately, dis he mm. didn't. The only person he, the, or the main person he deceived was himself. Mm. So, I, well that's my view. And someone who watched him and interrogated him very closely in the run-up <coughs> period. I mean that's my belief, but anyway, there, there it is. But the fact is, the information that he gave to the House was not accurate. And on the basis of that, we went to war and all the consequences mm. that have followed. Now, I do think that invites Parliament to say, well, what are we going to do about mm. it? Well, what do you then do? I mean, that's, I mean, mm. you know, if, if something goes, if, if someone behaves so egregiously mm. that they fall foul eas e easily of the mm. criminal law, then that's fine. But I agree with you. I mean, we're, we're not in that territory here. Uh, Equally, we're not talking about the sort of minor mistakes that everyone in this room has probably made in the work environment. We're talking about something with errors at best with catastrophic consequences. Um, I, don't, I, I just don't know what you do. I mean, there's, there's political accountability, mm. um, but that doesn't work if you're 15 years you know, down the line or whatever. You know, it's, that's not working. Um, what, what do you do? To you? Well, I think I think you could. I mean, I think you could have an inquiry <laughs> of a com of a commission yeah. quite into the conduct of ministers and officials on the basis. I mean, we have a, there's a nice quote from Michael Michael Quinlan in our report talking mm. about the relationship between parliamentary accountability, ministerial accountability, mm. and the inquiry system. And he talks about his nice phrase is uh, inquiries are the searchlights that provide the material for the anti-aircraft batteries. Now, the, the anti-aircraft batteries should be Parliament. That should be Parliament doing that. So I don't think it's good enough to say, well, actually, we had a nice report. We've discovered all this thing went wrong. We know we were misled by 
uh, by ministers. We'll just leave it like that. There's reputational damage, mm. of course. But I don't think the fact that it is some years ago means that we shouldn't, or Parliament shouldn't seek to explore the conduct of ministers against that resolution to truth-telling. So what would you do? You would be summoning Tony Blair back into Parliament? I would Parliament be marching yeah. some of these people in, and some of the officials, who are also, I think, given a hard time by Chilcott, to see actually what went wrong from the point of view of Parliament, who had to make a decision about war and peace. I'm quite interested. I mean, just that, that, that's fine, but it doesn't answer the fundamental... The, the, pre, the, the original question there. I mean, I think it's probably right, actually. I agree with you. But it still doesn't get over the problem of, as it were, individual accountability, mm. uh, which people feel that they would like to see. And you know, but it's very difficult to see how you can do that 15 mm. years in, in, yeah. in, you know, behind you. Uh, you know, even bankers uh, have their pay kind of, you know, in suspense mm. for only seven years. Uh, and uh, and you know, most politicians aren't in it for the money, so that isn't going to work. So you know you can't really kind of apply that same. I would just say though that to, I think I always, I came to the view that par the Parliament was most effective when it was drawing upon authoritative evidence from other. This is why the yeah. Public Accounts <coughs> Committee does well compared with other committees because it's yeah. got the NAO yeah. and so yeah, anybody so that comes in front of it, the they've already been done by the NAO. The evidence <laughs> is all there. It's, you know, they can't wriggle, they can't wriggle around it. Mm. So it's not just hot air stuff, mm. which is a lot of, what a lot of select committees yeah. is. Yeah. So I think that is, that is why a, a report provides the yeah. material for Parliament to do something mm. if it wants to do something. I'm, I'm going to give another question. I just very quickly wanted to ask, uh, ask Jonathan Paul, what sort of what do you think is happening in your organisations? They read Chilcot, it's got sort of, you know, this analysis of what happened. You know, do you take that back? You were mentioning, Paul, about the sort of process around rule. Are you thinking about, well, what actually does that mean for the way we operate? Do you think your successors I will be really doing hope, that sort I of I hope they should be. I mean, I, I've been sort of tweeting away suggesting they perhaps should be thinking about these things, which is the only voice mm. I seem to have these mm. days. Um, but I, th I think they should be sitting down and, uh, with the current attorney, the current law officers and working out proper process. I mean, I never had any trouble with any of my attorneys, which mm. included, um, you know, the tail end of Peter Goldsmith. Um, you know, they they were all absolutely proper, tremendous people. I don't know this attorney. I'm sure he's absolutely excellent, but I think there is a case to protect both the attorney, the law officers, and um, officials, lawyers, and clients within the civil service to having a proper protocol. I, I'm very interested, Keir Starmer, make a party political point here, he's, he's been calling for some sort of statutory process to be, to, uh, to be enacted to deal with the run up to war. And I think there is a case for thinking about this. I mean, it's, it's not something I would naturally sort of reach for, but I think it's something we should look at. But isn't the also, I mean, it's, it's, well, the interesting thing is, the issue hasn't been Parliament voting for, or not for war, it's been the degree of information available mm. in practice. Mm. I mean, it wasn't, you know, mm. really since, um, uh, certainly Iraq established mm. the two big votes, it was the degree of information mm. available at the time. I mean, I can I just, uh, two points. I think Tony's right. I mean, I think it, it's not allowing uh, an inqu inquiry to lie and say, oh, we've done that, mm. the parliamentary committees. Mm. Um, the successor to your committee mm. or relevant mm. one should follow it up. The other thing, I wouldn't underrate the reputational mm. aspect, yeah. the verdict of history. Now, that may not satisfy people who want you know, something dramatic to happen to individuals. However, <coughs> it is very, very powerful. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that, that um, for those involved in this and mm. other inquiries, the, 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 the clearly any perception of them is massively affected by what, what the Chilcot and other inquiries. Do you think, do you think the agencies will be sort of rethinking? Uh, no, I don't at all. Yeah. And, I, and the reason I say that is that nothing was revealed about the problems really that wasn't known right. post Butler. So there were, yeah. there were reforms post Butler, yeah. uh, there were new sort of procedures in, the system has changed, you've got the National Security Council, which changes those sort of things. Yeah. So in a sense, you, one is criticizing yeah. a set of arrangements which so no longer yeah, exist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, right there. Hello, um, it's, uh, my name is Chris Ames. I'm the editor of the Iraq Inquiry Digest uh, website. Um, I'm a journalist and I'm also the uh, co author of the uh, article in the Observer. I think Tony was mm. referring to earlier about the 
freedom of information that's mm. request for um, information about the environment. <coughs> um, I'd like to ask um, a sort of counterintuitive question to be asked about what, what did the inquiry say on the basis of information that it had exclusive access to that actually informed its conclusions? I have a real hobby horse mm. about the way that the inquiry gobbled up all the information that was available mm. for many years and sat on it wouldn't publish it and Freedom of Information Act requests were blocked on the basis mm. that this had all come out in the inquiry. But when you actually look through mm. the inquiry and try to link mm. the information that it revealed, some of which was quite mm. revealing, with its conclusions, we gave them a monopoly of information, we assume yeah. we had a monopoly of wisdom, but really if you look at all the conclusions it reached or didn't reach, on the basis of the, the decision uh, mm. to go to war, what did it tell us that we didn't already know? What did it tell Tony mm. that he didn't already know when he was voting against the war? Probably very little that hasn't already come out. So in a sense, mm. was it just second-guessing the, the, the parliamentary vote? If you look mm. at the, um, the analysis mm. that had the dossier, was written, it was really just a long copy and paste of earlier inquiries. Mm. It didn't really throw anything new on that, except perhaps a, some other spin doctors were suggesting that we would take the, the caveats and qualifications out when presenting the information. Yep. It ignored the regime change issue despite publishing information that said that Tony Blair was very much hoping that Saddam wouldn't cooperate yep. in February 2003. And most important, I think this has come up, the sheer act lie. It, it details in absolute yep. detail all the reasons why Tony Blair was not telling the truth when he put a voluntary motion for war before the House of Commons, when he said that we didn't get a second resolution because mm. Shearer said he'd vote down any resolution, whatever. Mm. It doesn't make any judgment or assessment of the validity of that claim at all. So going back to my earlier question, mm. can anyone point to anything that justified giving this inquiry over all these years a monopoly of information and a monop perceived monopoly of wisdom what did it do with that information that we couldn't have judged for ourselves anyway, the, the information it sat on all that time? So I'm not sure whether our panel feel that they're actually in a good enough position to no. answer that one. Anyone? No. I, I think don't know if I anyone can point to anything where the inquiry had that information that it had access to before the rest of us. And I, it drew up I, think, I think there's a very good question to put on the record. There may be some people mingling afterwards who are better placed to to answer that than our panel, but I think you've done a very good job in putting your <coughs> reservations onto, <laughs> onto the record there. Any further questions? Can I just say, by the yeah. way, that just so that this is, I think often, I mean, I agree with, I think, mm. the, just mm. what you say, which I said at the beginning that I thought mm. it told us what we, mm. what we knew, but, it, but nevertheless there is, I mean, the, the enormity of mm. the issue mm. meant there, I think there is a, there is, there, there, there is a need to try and tell the story in, as much detail as you can, even though the conclusions are ones that we felt that we already knew. So I'm not sure that I was expecting it to tell me things that I didn't know. Uh, and it didn't, but it told me a lot of detail that I didn't know that uh, I think is important to have. But the thing I was just going to say was, it's often said that you know people voted against the war. They didn't actually vote against the war. They they voted on a, on a motion which said that the process of containing Saddam and inspecting his weaponry has not concluded. Mm -hmm. that, and, and, that, and that therefore it was possible that it was, we were putting him back in his box mm -hmm. that in a way that didn't require, that was the, that was the crucial, and that has been absolutely yeah. vindicated mm -hmm. by Chilcott. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just wanted to wind up because um, we're getting very close to the thing. Yeah. Uh, just to, one thing to reflect on, one thing I'm going to ask you all. Um, we seem to have this sort of slightly binary system. The Institute for Government works with ideal <coughs> policy making. We tend to say government actually isn't necessarily terribly good at learning lessons sort of routinely. So we seem to have this almost binary system that we either sort of go on doing things, forgetting about things, the institutional memory is not really good, churning things through. And then something is so catastrophic or so difficult that we set up this sort of really major, years long, millions of pounds, judge led, not judge led inquiry. And I wonder whether there are sort of, you know, quicker, better ways of actually sort of picking up lessons and actually just improving our systems, whether anyone had any reflection on that. The second thing I really wanted to ask you all to end on 
is Tony's made a case for actually these are a great part of the British system, we should be proud of them. If you had to point to someone and say, this inquiry was really good, I think Jonathan's really often has done it, was really, actually really made a difference and did the business in a really effective way. And we can see that things have changed positively because of it. Can you offer, offer one? So if you may or may not reflect. Oh, oh yes, you've got one. Yeah, question there, sorry. The McPherson inquiry. McPherson inquiry. Okay, we've had McPherson as a, <laughs> yes. an offer of an impactful inquiry. Yeah, McPherson yeah. and Lord Phillips in, Mick Phillips inquiry into the BSE thing, yeah. which led to the establishment yeah. of the Food Standards Agency in a wholly different approach yeah. to food safety. Okay. Uh, what? Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Nimrod. Any more? Mm. Offerings on I, an inquiry I, that really... I, well, so, so am I saying. Um, so, yeah. Although, so, that also just hits the point that Teddy makes is, on some, the, 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 there's also a paradox about some of the inquiries. In some cases, the organisations concerned correct the... Mm -hmm. it, it, way before the inquiry is reported, especially when you're talking about a decade a long thing, which you know, yeah. is clearly true in some of the intelligence and just for professional reasons they wouldn't get it right. But the other cases, there are inherent structural flaws as there are with, with dealing with children, mm. but interaction with social services, where the inquiries come back again and again and again, as, te as Tony said. Mm. So there are kind of paradoxes. There. there is a learning process which sometimes makes inquiries after, uh, uh, after the, the date. But in other cases, it, you, you get the same lessons coming back. You know, we always hear this on... on, on case and, and yeah. So I think this really underlines the point for a more systematic view, particularly by parliamentary committees, mm. into lessons. Tony, any... Well, no, I mean, I'm just looking here because uh, we, we, we listed every inquiry uh, since 1900. <laughs> and and I, we, actually, we didn't, we didn't all sort of give them ticks as to whether we thought they'd been successful or not. But I, I mean, there's a few I'd take a punt on, really. Uh, I don't know whether labelling was... I mean, certainly the Bichard one yeah. was successful. Uh, the BSA uh, was successful, foot and mouth, um, probably laming on the first one on... Um, you know, chi yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think we don't want to be... <sighs> we don't want to be too cynical yeah. about this. And, and, and uh, you know, to support my general mm -hmm. thesis that this is a good thing, the, the, process of, the, the process of having an inquiry is a good thing. I mean, some inquiries will do better mm. than others and will lead to more serious recommendations which will be acted upon. But the pros that there's a, pu there's a public assurance <coughs> business of actually having inquiries. You know, uh, it won't, as Peter rightly says, it won't, it won't satisfy people because we live in a culture which wants to blame somebody for somebody. And, and inquiries which say it's all very complicated there are systems at fault here and there are many factors and all that. People don't want to know that. They just want to know who they're going to hang out to, to dry. But nevertheless, I still make the point <laughs> that we, this is, a, this is a, a tradition and a bit of our, our political culture uh, that we should nourish and take some amount of pride in. Okay, well that seems like an excellent point to stop on. So I'm going to thank our panel for a really interesting exploration of the pros and cons, some of the sort of interesting aspects of inquiries and things. Thank you all for your questions and your participation. So uh, if you'd like to thank our panel in the usual way.